So welcome everybody. I just wanted to make sure that the last people just arrive and everything on the tech side is working here. So uh, let me know if you have any problems in the chat or anything. I have a few people here helping us out with the webinar and the tech stuff. So yeah, and I see yes, people are still joining in. So welcome everybody. So my name is Gorm Eriksson and uh, the first question here was will the webinar will it will be recorded and it will be shared afterwards so it's a recorded webinar so welcome to our webinar about tech driven strategies to catch the invisible uh, dropouts um it's a pleasure to have you all here and i will have a few other speakers on this webinar i'll have one our director from the product who will be talking about how the product works seen from a student perspective and then on the show we will also have Tora representing a Norwegian institution and John from a Danish institution providing insights on how they work with Student Pulse our well-being platform um, and how to support students and today we will be talking about dropouts and I might use the term graduation rates dropouts retention rates I might use all the terms and essentially they are all the same it's about students that decides to leave education for some reason. And we will be talking about how to prevent that and work with um, you know, ensuring that every student is successful. My name is Gorm Eriksson. I am the CEO of Student Pulse. We are a Danish well-being platform that are working with institutions across the world to improve student well-being and student success. So I'm happy to have you here on the, on the webinar. And uh, let's just get started. Um, first of all, if you have any questions or anything, just put them in the chat. I have a colleague here who will be able to mark them as questions. And at the end of the session, we will do a Q&A session where both Tora, um, John, and Rune will be able to you know, re respond to those questions. So please ask them during the, the webinar. And you'll be able to also, if you click on, I think the handout material on the, on the, on the, within the webinar platform here, you'll be able to download the slides. And please say hello in the chat, uh, introduce yourself and where you're from. And uh, let's see if we can have some interaction here. So let's just get started with uh, our content here. The agenda for today is, I'll start by talking a little bit about the challenges uh, around student dropouts some of the factors contributing to dropout. And then Rune will be on the show to talk uh, more about the science behind student pulse check-in, our well-being platform. And he will be framing it a lot from the student perspective and how they experience checking in and reflecting on uh, you know, personal and social and academic emotions. And then we will have NKI and Mercantech who will be on the show to um, introduce how they work with student well-being, success, retention rates from an institutional perspective um, to support students to be successful. So that's the agenda for today. Um, yeah, let's just move into it. So let's start by the widespread challenge of student dropouts and what the some of the backgrounds and numbers really are related to that. So if you look at this, I think there is really three levels that you need to be perspective on or look at why dropout is significant. And the first one is really the nationwide focus. Most Western countries are experiencing de declining birth rates and every dropout or every student that decides to leave education is a lost opportunity. It could potentially be innovation, future workforce. So we really need every young person to be successful to support our future. And then there's the more institutional impact of a dropout. All of you here today on the webinar um, are representing institutions and it has a direct financial impact on the institution's budget. And it also has more of a ripple effect on the student community. The, it's a great indicator if you have high dropout rates, it's a great indicator to see that there's work to be done within the community, in your support system, in, in your understanding of the students to really support and engage your students. And then we have on the individual impact of students. It has a major social and individual impact. Every student that drop out, there's a story attached to it. 
a student might experience it as a loss or a failure of dreams and aspirations that could have been that never that they never realized. And it's important that we support the individuals to ensure that they are successful. So we have the nationwide focus, the institutional impact, very financially um, impacting, and then the individuals that we need to support. So that's the reason for that we need as vendors, as institutions and nations to focus on retaining and having successful students. So let's just look a little bit about the stats from different countries. I took three different here. The first one is graduation rates from the US. And if you look at the blue line there with the red arrow, it's the national average graduation rates from a six year period or it's six year completion trend. So what you will see here is that um, on average 62% of students graduate within six years. That also means that 38% doesn't graduate is a potential dropout. And in the US specifically, that leaves the dropout with a significant financial burden it, with tuition and student debt. So it produces uh, even longer term problems for students in the US. So 62% graduation rates. If we take a look at Danish universities, higher education, here is dropout rate dropout rates of first year students across the different main areas. And for instance, if we look at technical science, we will see that up against one in five students within the first year decide to leave education. The thing about the Danish way to evaluate dropout is that every student that decides to leave, it might even just be choosing another uh, subject uh, counts as a, as, as a dropout but somewhere between 15 and 25% dropout rates on first year students in Denmark, a lot of students. If we look at the UK, it's a different, it's a different way of measuring, but also a different number here. Uh, the UK, we have a few institutions and universities that we work with in the UK, and they do a lot of work in inclusion and diversity and access and participation. And when we look here at the third column, you'll see the percentages no longer in higher education, around 5.3%. The way that the UK measures this is that it's every student that started, and then we look 12 months later, and if they're not in higher education, they will count as a dropout. But there is this thing in the UK where after, with a, if a student decides to withdraw their application, or their, not the application, but, um, you know, withdraw from education within the first 50 days, they will not be counted towards a dropout. So quite different ways of measuring dropouts, but still significant number from somewhere between 5% all the way to 30, 40% within the first year of students deciding to leave education. Significant numbers. So let's look how we can approach this. And I think a great way would be to look at a quote from Dr. Gaper Machi. He's a Canadian physician, he's an author, and he says, if educators understood that the behaviors on the part of students are actually manifestations of the emotional dynamics of frustration and needs not being met, that would change the educational system. So it's about frustrations and needs not being met that we need to figure out. So let's look about frustrations and needs and students and what that contributes to and how that contributes to dropout. First of all, every dropout is a combination of factors. It could be personal, mental health, financial problems. It could be academic, struggling, and it could be social. And, every, and all the research there is suggests that it's never, it's usually never a single factor that predicts dropout. It's a combination of those factors that is at play. And every student that is deciding to leave education is always unique and layered. It's not one thing that you can do. But if we zoom in on this specific individual here, it's important to understand that there is a, a whole range of factors that we need to understand and support. And if we zoom out a little bit on the more global scale, there's research, a lot of great research from different regions and countries that 
for instance, the first one there is show what is the most contributing factor in the US? It's financial pressure for students. And that looks completely different in other regions. So it's, it's, it's great to understand that there will be a lot of differences between countries, regions, and types of institutions that you need to pay attention to. And then we have vendors just like us. We have more than a million feedback points from students about well-being, um, happiness, stress, that informs you on how to make decisions about well-being and student success. And our sister company, uh, Elevate, had more than 500 counseling sessions. They provide a service for institutions to do counseling sessions with students at risk. And after conducting those 500 sessions, they took note of the most prevalent factors contributing to at risk or dropout. So there is the individual students and the factors contributing to dropout that you need to understand. But there's also data from research and platforms like ours that will inform you how to address and ensure student success. And how do you work with that data then? And that's what we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, so first of all, you need to provide strategic efforts at the institution. It needs you need to understand research in your region. You need to have data from students that will be able to inform you on how what strategies you, you should implement. And that could be financial programs. It could be onboarding programs, inclusion and diversity programs. And those programs are important. They are long term, not an immediate result, but those are important for the for the longer um, success of your students. And then you need input and understanding of staff and lecturers and the classes and the programs that you're running. How well is the social dynamics of the classes and how is the academic part of the courses provided? And you need to have data that inform you to be able to work with staff and lecturers. And I know both NKI and Mercantech will present a little bit of experience in working both on strategic and staff and lecture level here with data. And then there is potentially the most potent part of working with uh, to prevent dropout and student success or ensure student success. And that's working specifically towards the students. And that would be to understand the nuances and the complexity of a decision regarding dropping out. And here you need to provide mental health resources, interventions, that is based on understanding the complexity of the students and the specific requirements of those. And I think Rona will come on stage now and present you with input on how we in Student Pulse work with well-being and provide interventions uh, with, uh, with that. So Rona is in the room with me here. Uh, so welcome on the show. We will just reduce the... <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Colm. So I will try to, uh, and I'll just skip to the next slide, uh, take it to the student level and really focus on well-being check-ins from, uh, from a student perspective. Um, and then I will let it be up to, to Tor and, uh, and John afterwards, like bring in the institutional perspective, as you just uh, mentioned, uh, Gorm. Uh, so for uh, this session, this brief introduction, I hope that you will get some inspiration. I will introduce a uh, couple of, of free frameworks that we use in student pools. So, so that is basically what is going on behind the scenes of, of our check-ins. Uh, so no matter whether you use student pools, uh, attend or, or uh, are planning to in the future, you should be able to take something from, from these concepts and, and bring into your own work with, uh, with well-being. But let's start with, uh, with the students. Uh, and it's not that I will uh, spend all of this session about uh, talking about myself, uh, but I actually will uh, start with uh, put you in the context of where I was uh, 10 years ago as a student, try to bring some of the nuances into to play, as you just said, uh, go on. Uh, so 10 years ago, I was uh, studying my master's. I just started my master's at a new university, came from another university studying my bachelor's. It was a new city. It was even a new language of studying. I studied Danish uh, beforehand. Now it was all English. So basically new, uh, new everything. Uh, I came from this institution where there were put a lot of efforts into uh, socialization. It was all based on group work, project work. So for a person like me, not outgoing in that sense, but really requiring these like social relationship, it was a huge advantage that I were kind of pushed into social relationships. 
So I went down there to, to this new university first day, I recall the day, <laughs> expecting social activities to, to go on, at least group work, something like that, that will help students to, to interact. Uh, and then I just, uh, I, I was met by like plain, plain lecture. That was it, right. The next week went by, the same, two weeks, the same, sitting there alone, a lot of students doing the same, not going there, meeting each other. Some students, students were completely fine, they studied together beforehand and so on. Uh, by coincidence, I met some students, so it turned out well. Next issue occurred. I really struggled with the English. I could read, I could write, but I didn't have the confidence to speak in front of fellow students. Uh, maybe related to the social part as well. Uh, I contacted student counseling. Uh, they were you know, good, I would say, but they didn't really help me. Uh, I enrolled at my old university at this point in time. Uh, and then by coincidence, I got in touch with like that counselor who helped me out sessions on English and etc. So it was well as well. And uh, then time went by exam hit multiple choice, never had that kind of exam, couldn't find information resources on how to prepare for multiple choice. All other students, they were familiar with it. So another issue, more academic issue, right? I figured that out as well. So, so what is the point with it? The point is, I would say is twofold. At the one hand, I was I was just lucky, honestly. I wasn't good or anything. I was just lucky. I enrolled at another university, so, and obviously I was in the risk of dropping out, right? But I was lucky in getting in touch with those people who helped me out, you know, personal uh, relationships, student counseling, and so on. But not all students, they will, you know, be uh, the same uh, or face the same luck. Uh, they will not be aware of the attitudes the same way that I was, I think. They won't be aware of the services available and, and so on. And at the other hand, of, you know, it really illustrates how issues, they go like this and how different issues might impact at different points in time, starting with some social issues, going towards more personal issues with the English and then towards academic issues with exam preparation. So with that said, I will try to use that story in uh, exemplifying our, our frameworks and how we work with uh, student well-being, well-being check-ins. In general, I would say that we use three different prerequisites of succeeding with a well-being check-in or any well-being initiative for that sake, if you work with, with similar activities. First, uh, we want to reach students. We want to make sure that the check-in is at hand at the students at the right point in time, right? We want the student check-in to be there and we want the student to click it, basically. We want them to interact with the check-in. That's, that's one task. We use a persona framework for that. Then when students, they have started the chicken, so they sit there with the phones like, or the, the laptop, we want to make sure that we uncover the right student needs uh, and that we provide students with the right solutions as well. So what are the right needs? We need to focus on those measures and those attitudes that have the greatest impact on student well-being at that point in time where we ask. For that, we use the framework you already mentioned, three of the dimensions, come and we had a, have a fourth one as, as well. And then you could, you're sitting there like, isn't that enough? So if you have students to check in, you know, interact with the check-in, you actually measure the attitudes you provide them with solution, isn't that enough? But no, it's not. There will be barriers for students, even, you know, acknowledging themselves that they need some sort of support that had just been provided to them. There will be barriers for not using. So that is where the product really comes into play. So like this whole technology that makes sure that students, they move from, you know, I would say attitudes to, you know, to, to implementation intentions, to actually behavior, to actually using the service that is the most relevant one. So let me introduce those uh, three uh, concepts. Um, the first one is uh, this one. In Student Pulse, we work with three different uh, personas when we uh, reach students. And we simply do it because of that reason that in the same way as students will face different issues at different points in time, they will also trigger on different communication, different resources, different sources, uh, so we need to target our communication, our distribution strategy towards different students. Uh, so I would really recommend if you work with well-being initiatives, then, you know, consider uh, not just uh, approaching all students in the same way and not approaching like 5,000 students in, in 5,000 different ways, right? But find those like main personas, like really uh, exemplifies how your students are. Emma, social and academic focus. We have Jacob with more obvious issues, like you know uh, that he has mental health struggles, and then we have Omar, who is like new to the seat. I, I was kind of Omar. I know I was traveling 200 kilometers in Denmark, not not really like to a new country, right? But 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 still, everything was new to me, so I was facing different issues, and I would have triggered on different communication at that point in time. 
So that is how, like, that's the that's the essential part. We want students to click, and we use these personas as the frame of reference when we build distribution strategies. And then we get the students to click. We get them to interact with the with the check and write. And then it's all about measuring, uncovering the student needs, uh, because we have dimensions played, but we need to take into account the students. They are different. So what we do here is that we have a framework of four different dimensions. Gorm already mentioned, like the personal, the social, and the academic well-being. And then we have this one called fulfillment or flourishing, more of a the bigger meaning with this, like what I invest in this is that what I expect to get return and, and so on, which according to research is, is really, really strong and impacting in well-being as, as well. So we focus on these different dimensions and then we focus on what points in time uh, are uh, these dimensions contributing to well-being the most. So there will, in my case, uh, with the, the new university, obviously in the beginning, it was all about a social thing. Uh, it's many for many new students. I would say, it's a particular bachelor students, like the first semester, can be difficult. New student to face and so on, right? Uh, but no, for me, it was the same social issue. Then we turned towards more of a, I would say, personal issue with English skills, and onwards to academic issue with the uh, with the exam uh, preparation and so on. So it really illustrates how my needs were like this. And for some of them, I wasn't, you know, aware of. It was just coincidence that I uh, coincident that I got like the the solution right. And finally, we want to bring into play the right uh, actions, the right solutions as well to the students. So if I'm struggling at that point in time, I'm struggling with social relations. I had no one to sit with. Yeah, if I was just like, hey, do you want to team up with other students sitting alone? I know that's a bit straightforward to put it right. Then I would obviously say, yeah, that could be relevant to me. Right. So we need to tie this, you know, to the actions to the actually attitudes uncovered. That is from this really student perspective and then Tor and Jon will bring in perspective how you know look more across students across classes programs and, and so on to work at a more generic level good so you get students to uh, click they start you measure the right things at the right point in time you uh, also suggest the right actions and then for that to convert into actually student action we use these like five steps in our feedback flows uh, or our check-in flow. So first of all, we want to build transparency uh, towards the students and we want to reduce stigma. We want to communicate to students that it's actually okay to not feel okay, that other students, they use this as well, can be a huge barrier. I need help, but I don't want to do that. Then the second thing is to, you know, uncover the attitude. I won't go in depth. That is what I just talked about. But the third step, so what is in the middle here, right, is the whole reflection. Um, we want students to reflect upon, you know, their attitude both if they are feeling well and not feeling well. Different questions will then be followed up. And the reason I would say is twofold. At the one hand side, we want to uh, kick off this like process in the student mind that help them understand like, how can I improve from here? What can I do myself? Because it's important to stress the student pulse. It's a tool where we want students to take ownership, but we also want to help them to take that ownership if it makes sense. So that is the one hand side. And obviously at the other hand, we want to use that written input, you know, when we form our suggestions as well. So we want the score, we want the written text, and we want to combine it into recommending something to the student. And speaking about recommendations, what you see in the fourth step is actually this like a uh, step where we try to build implementation intentions. This is a new step that we will introduce to student course to make sure that students actually uh, who, who needs the service, like uh, according to the data, at least or according to the feedback, they also will make use of it afterwards. Because what will often happen is that you will measure three, four or five different things during a check-in, right? So you can't just like throw all the actions at the end of the check-in and then hope for the students to use these check-ins. You need to enforce the behavior up front, making sure like, okay, this student understand he or she has an issue. This is the reason, the reflection and like, yeah, that is, that is, that is relevant to me. They will be more eager to use the so solution at the end of the check-in. And then the student uh, gets to the end of the check-in and we will suggest these solutions, right? Uh, in some occasions in severe, I would say like if severe issues, they are uncovered, we would you know trigger the event right away. So if a student reply indicates that this student is just like, so like filled with depression or anything like that, we just want to prompt that action right away. But in most occasions, we prompt at the end and we know what priorities are the most important ones to, to students. And final remark that would be to like split up these different uh, initiatives in two. We work with one-to-one -one support. That is where students, they identify themselves. And then we work with self-help initiatives, 
resources, tutorials, material, stuff like that, events for that sake, where they can seek help themselves. Because there are, I would say, it's a kind of a 50-50 split that students needing help uh, and who is offered a one-to-one -one support and acknowledge that they want that one-to-one -one support, they won't take it because it's one-to-one -one support. But because, but if there's like a similar solution from a self-help perspective where they can just read themselves, go through the video, whatever, they will take that instead. So it's all about this, what we call solution mix as well. So I think I will uh, end it there, uh, Gorm, uh, and uh, you'll get the material. Uh, and also in the material, there'll be an example of an actual check-in where you can click through and so on. So uh, I think uh, I think that was it. Yeah. And leave it up to Tor and John. So please uh, welcome uh, Tor on the stage. Um, and thank you for being here. So, um, but so I assume you could do a quick introduction on yourself and uh, yes. you will have the slides. Perfect. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tora Reita and I work at uh, NCOI as head of uh, the Department of Study Quality. I have uh, over 10 years experience in the education sector and are responsible for collecting, reporting and anal analyzing student feedback, as well as proposing quality uh, enhancing measures. I have... Yeah. Okay about NCOI. NCOI offers vocational education, education on high school level and courses. All education at NCOI are online and flexible. That means that our students can start every day. Due to our student group, it's especially important for us to reach students at various stages of their student journey. NCOI was the first in Europe to offer online education, but fortunately we have evolved since then. We have around 4,500 yearly students and have experienced that the request for online and flexible education is increasing. A flexible education online can be challenging for the students and therefore we are committed to providing motivating learning experiences. So, why student pools? We recognize the need for a system that can provide us with a closer contact with the students and where data was accessible and easy to use. When our students are not in a traditional classroom setting, it becomes crucial for us uh, to meet them where they are. As a result, we initiated a pilot project with student pools early last year and we have now successfully integrated it across all our courses and programs. Yeah, the students get the questions tailored to their individual student journey. And why is this so important? It is essential for our students to get off to a good start. We have observed a correlation between how quickly students get started and the number of students that complete their education. This is especially important when our students may not start uh, at the same time as a larger group of students. When, start, when students start each day, we can't send out service that will resonate with all our students at the same point in their student journey. If the questions they receive are not uh, relevant at that moment, there is a higher likelihood of non-responses and we may not gain the insights that we desire. Therefore, they will get the questions um, in our platform on a given time in their student journey. Then we identify uh, where better information and introduction are needed. 
and we constantly stay updated on our students' satisfaction with their courses and the motivation levels during learning activities. Hopefully, uh, this will contribute to more students completing their education and reducing dropouts. Okay, the most uh, crucial source in our uh, quality work is uh, the student. Therefore, uh, we need good and detailed feedback uh, from students about various aspects of their education. It was important to us to be able to view this feedback at a program level as well as a subject level. This provides us uh, with the opportunity to compare on multiple levels and obtain uh, more detailed feedback. We stay continuously updated on our progress in relation to our strategic goals. And uh, one of our um, key strategic goals is uh, to have as many as students as possible to complete uh, their education with us. And the feedback from student pools forms a solid foundation for discussions uh, with our students, most importantly, uh, organization and forums uh, to determine how we can enhance uh, the student journey even further. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening to me and my insights. That was uh, what I got and I will see you in the Q&A part. Thank you for just giving us a very quick introduction here. And John, it would be excellent if uh, you would step on stage and um, provide a little bit more context to how you work with student success and uh, feedback. So welcome, John. I'll do that. Thank you. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, that, that's great. Uh, as mentioned, I am with Mercantech been there for 19 years and uh, my position is uh, head of education so you call it headmaster for all our vocational educations and our training courses Mark and Tech um, holds approximately 30 vocational educations for high school educations and about for 500 training courses uh, in the Danish system called AMU which is courses related directly to labor market which also means that we have a very great diversity of uh, of our students and student characteristics. We cover all the personas that uh, Rune mentioned in his uh, part. So, so and some of our students are here for us for very short time, and some are here for for longer time. What I, I think what we're going to concentrate on today is uh, dropouts uh, related to the the longer educations, our vocational educations. Approximately 2,500 students, uh, full-time equivalent, uh, uh, attend our educations every year and uh, served by uh, 450 staff members. And um, my responsibility goes, as I said, for all the technical and all the vocational educations at, at the school, which covers roughly 14, 1,400 uh, full-time equivalent students. Yes. Uh, about uh, about student pulse, we've been working with student pulse for quite some time, and I think that uh, one of the interesting things is what uh, Dr. Matei was uh, mentioned earlier by um, by Gorm, where he, he talked about the student needs not being met, and um, he might be right. Uh, definitely, he's right. Uh, sometimes we think that we know the students needs uh, and we act uh, as if we know the students need but we found out we realized that often we didn't know the students need so we had to get into a sort of communication with the students to find out what are their needs as you have experienced staff experienced teachers been in the business for many many years we tend to say to ourselves, yes, of course we know the students' needs. But the fact is that we definitely know the students' needs of what we could call 
yesterday's or yesteryear's students, but not necessarily for the students uh, being into our institutions today, because students' needs changes uh, over time. And these years, we find that the students' needs uh, actually change rapidly. So we had to come up with a system where we could more have a real-time, online, real-time uh, communication with the students about their needs. So so that's why we, and I'll here turn to the strategic efforts, efforts, say how could we make database decisions? We made decisions on, on the feedbacks from the students who already had graduated or was about to graduate. So we all had to look back and see, hey, the last class we had said so and so, so now we will change to the next class, but never knowing what the needs of the next class would be. So therefore it was sort of retrospective point we had on, on student well-being. Using a student pulse, we could get a more uh, real, real-time insight in what the students' needs are, so that the the teacher could have a direct conversation with his class about what are the actual needs of the students of this class sitting here by me today. So, so uh, that was uh, what we started using um, student pulse to get database decisions. Also, we work with teacher teams, professional learning communities, and often we have discussions about classes, different teachers, as they are different personalities, could have different perspective on the same class. So we tend to have a discussion on who is right on this. And uh, this is not a, a very fruitful discussion to to discuss uh, who's right and wrong about it. So we also needed a system who could provide us with some, we could call them more objective or generic results. Uh, so now the teachers uh, working in a team on the class could get, get more or less the same picture from the students. You might have seen this, the other teacher might have seen something else, but when we're asking the students, here is what they said. So dear teachers, would you, plan, would you please try to relate to the responsibilities or the responses that we've got from the students? And uh, that uh, has definitely given us, given us a much more quality in, in what we had before, talking about uh, student retention or student dropout. And uh, also, it's very because that the students are not very explicit uh, so we could talk about, yes, we think we know, but here we have uh, quite uh, quite easy. We could see what, what are the specific needs of this class. And we have had activities, onboarding activities from a class, which is usually being very successful. And we suddenly have a class who is composed by some different students who said, those activities about onboarding is not really interested for us. They, may, they might have been for us, but not for us. Okay, now we have the, change, the chance to change our approach to the students from one day to another. So to say, we could have a student pulse uh, indication on Friday and actually we could change and relate to the, res responsibility, uh, the responses already on Monday morning. So in, in fact, we could, we could conduct activities that is synchronized or in sync with the students' actual needs. Also, uh, the staff and lectures, uh, micro surveys, usually we have had surveys uh, one time every semester. And as I said before, it was very retrospective. Now we get real time micro surveys and they are very easy for the students to, to answer. It takes one to five minutes, and uh, and we have actually very high response rates. It is above 80, tending to 90% uh, response rates, which is also very important uh, if we have to really do act, act on it. Also, these response rates gives us a high validity and reliability, which also means that uh, it's legitimate for the teacher to approach the class and say, hey, 
you said last week that uh, if we change it this way, how would how would it be? How would it feel for you? And then we have a dialogue based uh, on student response, and we also have this ability to create a, re a closer student teacher relation. Also, we have here a, a, a shortcut to uh, to student counseling. If students they need uh, help from anything, uh, it might be hands, it might be according to the mental health or according to well-being or according to apprenticeship. So we have here and and they really use it that's our experience it's 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 non it's not dangerous to say to the counselor i need through the through the student pulse i need some help it's anonymous for the rest of the class and the, the student counselor can say hey i have one or two or three in this class who needs help and he can she can address them immediately and also i think uh, going to the student level it encourages also the students to talk about their needs for well-being and not just being a reluctant telling about that it's I have it I have a bad day today or I have a bad uh, night last night or whatever so we really have also opening up the student dialogue in in, in this uh, in this way when we uh, started out with the uh, student pulse we saw that uh, one of the one of the main obstacles or one of the main reasons for a student dropout was uh, the need in the Danish system to have an apprentice contract you start on the basic year and after that year you have to go to a company have to have an apprentice contract and we could see that some of the students were very reluctant trying to seek those uh, apprentice contracts. And when the, the basic term ended, they actually had no, no contract, so they had to stop their education and they were set on hold until they could get an apprentice contract and actually out of the school. So we have started a, a new procedure where we start uh, actually the very first day talking with the students about the need for an apprentice contract. Also, we could see that if the students got an apprentice contract early in the in the in, in the in their education, it would give them a greater motivation for working. Also, when it gets tough, because it will get tough. Learning is a tough. Uh, it's a tough job, and it hurts sometimes. And it, um, as I used to say. If it hasn't hurt, you haven't learned enough. So it has hurt. It will hurt. But if you have a, a, a perspective, you have a company who is waiting for you, who you have a company who actually pays you a salary, it really gives you another perspective. Also, higher motivation to overcome the obstacles when it gets tough. So we used also a student pulse here as a notching tool to all to start asking the students have you got an apprentice contract have you any trouble getting an apprentice contract could we help you getting an apprentice contract? so all of this talking about the apprentice contract really raised the students awareness of hi right, i think i'd better get one uh, and uh, and in that way we raised the level of uh, of student uh, apprentice contracts from about uh, 40 percent by the end to 80, 90 percent, so that almost all students had a apprentice contract when they leave the basic course. Also, in that way, preventing a, a dropout. Um, when we talk about uh, student pulse, we also need it in uh, in different ways. Actually, we started with pre-boarding. We could talk about dropouts. It's a little odd, but we actually talk about dropouts of students before they started, because we know the students are going to start uh, three to four months before they actually are enrolled. And in that way, we want to communicate with the students and also there say hello to the students. We are happy that you have chosen Mercantech as your, as your educational institution. What can we do for you? What are your needs 
uh, have you anything that you need need us to know to tell us about? So in a in a pre door boarding phase, we also need the student pulse. Then we change it, and I'm very concentrated on the onboarding on the first 42 weeks, four weeks. We talk about onboarding boarding. Then we change the questions so they're more related to the learning activities. Are the learning activities that we are conducting right now, are they in sync with your needs? And when at the end of the basic course, we, we, we change again uh, the questions so that they are more focused on the next step, getting into the company. So we helping the students, you could call it like an exit strategy out of the basic comp uh, out of the basic course onto the company. And in the next step we're going to work with, we're not, uh, we're not introduced to that yet, is that we would love to, to have the student pulse surveys continue when the students, they are in companies. So we are able to follow the students' well-beings in companies because dropouts are also happening in companies. And more and more dropout, the dropout rates, rate is actually rising in companies right now because the companies are not that aware of the students' changed needs. So if companies, they do business as usual, they will face a racing student dropout. So our next step will be to, to introduce a student pulse also in the company uh, area. And then about the last thing I'll say is uh, about dropouts. We talk about uh, preventing dropouts, but I also have to, to state that some dropouts are necessary. We have students coming directly from public school and they have very little knowledge about what education they are starting on, what it will say, and often they have it taken a choice that is not the good part for them. So I think that the 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 main, the main thing here is to also find out the students that are not, so to say, on the right shelf, uh, self, and help them getting a, a, towards an education that they really want and need and that they can be motivated for. So I think we use student pulse in, in different ways, but uh, to sum up, it definitely had given us a more clear perspective on the students, uh, also a clear perspective uh, management wise, so that we're able to have more data driven decisions. I think that's uh, almost uh, sums up what uh, I have chosen to say here. So back to back to Gorm and his crew. Thank you. And uh, it would be excellent if we could have Tora on stage as well, just to ramp up a few questions here at the end. So um, thank you a lot, John, for sharing and Tora as well, sharing your insights. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. But there was, uh, Luisa started putting in a question here about uh, uh, the student check-in. Is that an app that uh, requires a phone? And I think uh, maybe Rune can share a little bit of insights on on, on the technical part of how Student Pulse is working. And uh, it would be great also, uh, Tora and John, if you would um, supply a little bit uh, insights on that. But mm -hmm. first you, Rona. Yeah, so, so the short answer is, is no, it's like rather web application that is access, you know, uh, it depends how it is that uh, comes to students' hands, I would say. Uh, we use one approach with you, Tora, right? And another one with, uh, with you, John, as you just mentioned. So, so no, it's not a... a, a an application in that sense. No, so the students won't require to install anything, but um, Tora, maybe mention a little bit how we approach this at NKI. Yeah, uh, we put um, links in the QR uh, codes in our platform uh, on um, in the different courses. So the student uh, will find them uh, when it, fits in their uh, student journey. And uh, we al also sent one uh, on uh, text message to our students uh, different, but uh, all the others are, are uh, in our platform uh, in Canvas um, mm -hmm. in their courses. So they will find it there. Yeah. Um, 
So it's a highly automated approach where it's more of a, I wouldn't even almost call it like a mandatory check-in in, in, in Canvas in the learning management system. So that is one approach yeah. to, to do it like that. And I do know, uh, John, that you took a different approach to be more interactive with the students because you have them physically at campus. Um, so yeah, please share a little bit about that. Yes, uh, what we uh, we would like to to have the to to raise the the student um, answer rate, uh, we would we have it more hand hand driven. So, uh, so we send an an SMS a text with a link that the students they uh, they will answer, and then we have they will answer while they are in class, and uh, we will collect the results, and afterwards we'll have the discussion the day after. So it's more hand driven or hand hand carried uh, than uh, than automation. But I, I like the approach, Tora. Uh, we could actually put in a QR code at uh, uh, at our learn space management as well. So it might also be a way we could uh, we could have it. But I think first it has been very important for us to to raise the the answer rate. So that's why it's hand 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 driven. Yeah. Yeah, and there's just to put a, a perspective on that. There's multiple ways to to reach students. It um, and we are obviously at Student Pulse working a lot on um, you know enrollment for the students so they can enroll and we can use notifications on their phones or text messaging if we want to fully automate it. And if you have institutions like John is mentioning where we have a lot of teacher engagement with the feedback it requires um, potentially more from the teacher side to actually share it and, and receive the feedback and discuss the feedback. So it's, 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 it's different what the, the approach that, that the approach could be. I think I would like uh, to ask you, Tora, uh, a question here as well. Um, so how did you figure out what, what to ask and when, when to ask the right questions um, as a part of that? You mentioned a little bit about it, but you know, what is the, we call it the framework of questions, but how did you figure out what the right questions are to be asked? Okay, uh, we uh, had a, worked with Runa and uh, had some workshops when where we had uh, um, from all the different uh, departments of our organization joining and uh, figured out what was the most important for the students on the different levels in their student journey. Uh, like the first um, the questions we ask is all about the um, the start of the education. Have you got the information you need? Do you have you? Yeah, are you getting started in a good way? Because we know it's uh, really important for our students to to get a quick and good start uh, in our studies. So, and we also have our uh, quality system where we have our uh, different. Uh, I don't know the word <laughs> and the different subjects are in our quality system. So we picked some of them and highlighted uh, them in student pools and picked questions that fit in in those um, subjects. Yeah. OK. And then I also know from the work with you that we introduced a few uh, items to some of those questions to drive activity right away. So I do know, for instance, if some of this uh, students were struggling to find their way through Canvas. They were yeah. immediately uh, engaged in a in a Canvas webinar to ensure that they got hands on that. So that's also a, something that is important both to understand what is when do we need to ask certain topics about what what is really driving um, you know potential dropout or frustration from the students, and then based on that, see if we can engage them directly to take action. Yeah. And of course, in the in the last questions we have, uh, do you, if they have everything they need for uh, to finish their exams, uh, the information, the practical, and also the learning outcomes. Uh, so uh, of course, it would it will follow their student journey and um, yeah, give them also um, information or or contact points um, if they answer that they don't have the information that they need or yeah. Yeah, so really try to understand. So having exam preparation is crucial in the last step of the education. Yeah. And if you need it, here is the resources that yeah. you need. Yeah. 
John, could you put a little bit? I, I do know that from you know some of the some of the work that we have been doing together, it it can be a little bit of an obstacle to start to have uh, evaluation of teachers. Uh, they, they might see it as a measuring tool of their uh, ability rather than a you know frustrations and needs tool towards the students. Um, how did you go about? the implementation process with teachers and lecturers to ensure that they were a part of the process and understood the difference between evaluating them as, as lecturers compared as opposed to needs and frustrations of the students? Uh, yeah, yes, and, and <laughs> that's, that's a good question and, and also rather com compli complicated. I, I think the key word here is the teachers uh, are always striving to deliver best quality. And uh, I think the quality discussion is, uh, is the central point here. And, and also it's very important uh, that this is not a question of evaluating teachers, but it's actually a tool for the teachers to get more engaged uh, with the students. Uh, some, some of our teachers uh, are very... Uh, are very skilled and are very high, have a very high perspective on, on their skill. And this is this is why they're teachers, because they like to teach industrial machining or uh, or whatever, automation, whatever. It is really what that what that drives them. And we could say that the the conversation, the student relation is for a lot of our teachers not necessarily the, the top priority or the top skill. But we could use student posts uh, here to help our teachers to get into a more sensitive discussion with, uh, with the students, uh, also about uh, subjects that are not for the very skilled teachers uh, natural. So we have to, to, to help them. And, and here we use student posts as a, as a, as a, as a tool to, to start the discussions in the classes. And sometimes we actually did with uh, a teacher and uh, and a student council, so we invited the student counselling in, into into the classroom, and uh, then the, the, with the teacher and the student counsellor uh, having discussions uh, related to the answers from the student polls with the class. And uh, this is not it's very important. It's not a judgment of teachers we're working with here, but uh, it is it is more a a tool for dialogue. Great. So on the final question here, I have that for Rune, unprepared. <laughs> um, so, but what, one of the things that we are often asked is, okay, we'll just provide you with more data and we have to spend more time on looking all, on all the data. And I do know that that is something that, you know, our strategy that is very important. Could you put a little bit perspective on the final note here on how we are driving, you know, not just providing more data, but driving our product towards being more action driven and, and delivering on that? Yeah, in, in a minute or 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so basically, we, <coughs> everything that you heard today, you know, we'll, we'll keep doing, but we are pursuing a direction where we become more clever, more automated about uh, providing the right solutions to students, like based on, I would say, like a general assumption of how the student is feeling or not feeling right based on all of the questions, based on all of the text inputs, what are the right solutions for this students? Not necessarily something that we have built beforehand, but simply pointing into, into the right, right directions at the one hand. And then from the institutional perspective, really putting efforts into highlighting what is most valuable. Uh, you've seen it already tour and, and John read our new AI uh, you know, upgrade, right? That, you know, we highlight those comments that according to other reps using student posts are the most valuable, right? So that is like on the institutional part, briefly. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you all of you for attending the webinar and um, staying uh, to the end. And uh, we will be sharing um, a short, uh, you know, recording, not a short, we'll be sharing the recording and a little bit of uh, requirements for you to provide feedback so we can improve the, 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 the quality of our webinars in the future um, and yeah reach out to us if you have any additional questions or would want to engage with us so thank you a lot for your time and uh, staying uh, with us today so thank you Tora and John
Ja, en rune. <laughs> <laughs> See you. Have a nice one. Hey.